things in my life. God is doing good things in my church. I believe that God is working. Because Jesus rose from the dead. I now have access to his presence. His resurrection is my resurrection. I have come to give him praise. He alone is worthy of my praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. This is Mighty Warrior song number three. You call us out from the depths. You call us out from the Tender wind. 
whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. Your good, good father is who you are, is who you are, is who you are, and I'm loved by you. Just what we need before we say a word. Your good, good Father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect. You are perfect in all of your You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. child of God, if you've repented of your sins and you're living for the Lord, this is who you are this morning. Sing that again, guys. Your good, good Father is who you are, is who you are, is who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am. Welcome, church family, and happy 4th of July. And if you're a guest visiting with us, I'm uh, delighted that you've decided to tune in. If you'd like to receive weekly emails from me, uh, just to keep you updated, just email me, Andy McCutcheon2010 at Gmail, and I'd be glad to add you to the list. Well, there's a song that I'm, I'm sure you've probably heard. It's called God, God Bless the USA, and the lyrics go, I'm proud to be American, where at least I know I'm free. And I love the lyric of that song, where at least I know I'm free, because it, it basically communicates, you know, we've got our problems, we've got our issues, and certainly we have our disagreements, This, uh, you know, that, that are in the news and, and in social media, and we've got all kinds of arguing and disagreeing and politics and all the things that are happening. And yet, at least we know we're still free. I, I love that. I love the topic of freedom. In fact, the five freedoms 
the First Amendment, in the First Amendment of the U.S., Constitution protects speech, religion, press, assembly, and the right to petition the government. Together, these five guaranteed freedoms make the people of the United States of America the freest people in the world. That's, that's pretty awesome. I, I don't think, maybe, maybe we don't talk about our freedom or appreciate our freedom as much as we should. I love the topic of freedom. There's nothing like freedom. When I think of freedom, I think of the freedom that we have to vote. Often when a, a communist country uh, you know, or a country that's uh, corrupt, the government is corrupt, often when they're set free, one of the first things they do is they, they, they vote. And, and they, people show up by the droves because they've never had the freedom to vote before. The thought of losing your freedom is a terrible thought, isn't it? Um, it's a terrible thought. Uh, um, it's a troubling thing to think of uh, the possibility of not being able to, uh, it's been a, it's been a hard thing not to be able to cross the border into Canada. I'm going on two years now since I've been able to cross the border into Canada to see, to see my family. And frankly, to, to know what's going on in the southern border, how people are coming in by the droves and I can't go to, to Canada certainly isn't Mexico and you know quite a different country there and to not be able to go to Canada and see my I understand the COVID rules and I understand it all but it just the thought of not being able to go across the border like I used to is just kind of a troubling thought to me not the thought of not being able to practice my faith and to be told what I should believe or what I can preach or what I can't preach is a troubling thought. To think that, you know, there would be those that maybe would say, in fact, I've been told by some that, you know, I should really never mention anything about sexuality or uh, a gender or morality. I mean, those are topics just, let's just not talk about that stuff. And I'm thinking, wow, this stuff is in the Bible. And, and the reason these things are an issue is maybe because we haven't talked to them and, and, and proclaimed what the word of the Lord has to say about those issues. Well, uh, it's it's a troubling thing to think of losing your freedom. Uh, it's a troubling thing to think of losing your freedom of speech, the possibility that that could ever happen. Um, freedom is a great topic. Well, we're going to talk about freedom today. Would you like to turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5? This is part 3 in a series that I actually started a couple weeks ago, but this is part 3, Galatians uh, of Galatians, and I'm looking at chapter 5 today. You can follow along as I read. Chapter 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you do not, if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace, verse 5, for through the Spirit, just say through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. May God bless the reading of his word. Father, I pray that you would speak through your word. I believe you want to speak to us. And one of the best ways you do that is through the, the word that you have gifted us with. I pray you would speak through your word as I proclaim it, and then our answer and response would be, yes, Lord, and amen. Well, quick quick review in part one, we talked about Paul said in Galatians 1 that there is only one gospel. And in fact, he says in Galatians, Galatians 1 verse 6, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Well, in partly part two, we talked about how uh, we talked about follow the crucified Christ, not the Americanized Christ 
or not the Americanized Jesus. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Paul said it's not about how big your ministry is or how small your ministry is. It's about whether Christ is the center of your ministry. And so in, in America, we would say, well, bigger is better. Well, actually, the Bible teaches obedience is actually better than bigger. And the question is, are we keeping Christ at the center? Are we focusing on him? Are we obeying what he wants us to do? That might mean that we get bigger. It might mean that we get smaller. That's not the point. See, in America, we think, well, bigger is, has to be better. And in, in the gospel, it's not necessarily always, always the case. Well, today I want to look at freedom, of course. The topic of freedom, number one, value your freedom. In Pennsylvania, when I served there back in 2000, uh, 2001 to 2003 at a wonderful church called Christ Wesleyan Church, right in the middle of the state in a little town called Milton. I remember a guest, uh, a guest preacher who preached in the Sunday evening service back in the days when we had Sunday evening services. Uh, we had, it was a large church, and so we had at least, I would say, 200 plus people that came Sunday evening. And we had this guest speaker. and She was a fiery lady. And I honestly forget what country she was from. But I remember at least a dozen times in her message, she would shout from the microphone the statement, the United States is the best country in the world. I mean, she did it with that kind of enthusiasm at least a dozen times, if not two dozen times. Now, as a I'm a naturalized, you know, fully fledged U.S. citizen. I wasn't born here, but I'm a full fledged New U.S. citizen and I love America. I appreciate America. I'm born and raised in Canada, but I love America and I'm proud to be an American. But I thought that's a little over the top, like, you know, a dozen times shouting the United States is the best country in the world. I thought, I, I, okay, get, okay, lady, just, you know, just move on. Well, well, this lady grew up in a different country where she didn't have the kind of freedom that we have here in America. She had a little bit of different perspective. She appreciated and valued the freedom that perhaps we take for granted. When I became a U.S. citizen back in 2000, fall of 2010, uh, I remember in preparation for that, it took several years to prepare for that, and I had to do reading and do a test and whatever. And in the reading, I remember the words kind of jumped off, off off the page at me. The words, in the United States, we value the freedom of assembly. You know why it jumped off the page at me? Because I, I never really thought of not having the freedom of assembly. And to see it in writing actually impacted me. I thought, oh my goodness, there are countries that don't. I thought, well, of course, there are countries, communist countries, you know, former, uh, you know, the, the former uh, Soviet Union and, and, you know, northern, uh, what is it? I was going to say Iraq, Iraq maybe would be the case, but um, a communist country. Yeah, but, you know, I, I never thought of not having the freedom of assembly. But that day I realized I didn't really value, I didn't really value the freedom that we have. Value your freedom. Paul says, God says through Paul in verse 1, he says, it is for freedom the Christ has set us free. It's kind of an unusual way of saying Christ sets people free. It's freedom that Christ sets people free. You know, is God just spelling it out so we, we don't miss it? Like, is this an emphasis thing? So, uh, you know, to make a point? Yes, I, I think so. I, th I think so. There's more than just forgiveness of sin, for which we celebrate with communion, the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. We should cherish that and celebrate that and be thankful for that and value that and appreciate that. But Paul is saying, basically, there's more than just forgiveness. There's actually more. There's freedom. There's not just forgiveness of sin. There's freedom from sin. There's deliverance from sin. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free, not just so we can go back and wallow in the same bondage. No, he's able to set us free. In fact... When Christ sets you free, your freedom surpasses your circumstance. Or at least it can. Your freedom can surpass, if you will, your circumstance. That's just my wording. But there are people today, I'm, I, I am convinced and I've, I've uh, heard of some of these people. I've seen them interviewed more than I've seen them in, in real life. But there are people today in jail that are more free than some of us who are not in jail because it's Christ that has set them free. They're not free because of what country they live in. They're not free because of a, a, a particular government uh, system of government. They're not free because of their circumstances. They're free because 
Christ has set them free. And that's the, the emphasis that Paul is saying. Real freedom, real freedom isn't just your country that you live in or your system of government. Real freedom is when Christ sets you free. And so that's, that's why Paul is so pointed, as I'll point out in just a minute, in this, in this letter to the Galatians, because he wants them to understand the value of freedom. John chapter 8, 36 says, So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And when Christ sets you free, no one can take that freedom from you unless you let them, because it's not dependent upon your circumstances. Value your freedom. Number two, walk in your freedom. Walk in your freedom. He says, stand firm then, verse one, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. We have a choice in the matter. You can choose, uh, only Christ can set you free, but you can choose whether or not you stay free. That's what that is saying. Don't let yourselves, do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Galatians 5, 16, if you look with me, I hope you have your books open in front of you. Uh, you know, turn off everything else. Uh, get the distractions out of the way. Focus in right now. Galatians 5, 16 says, So I say, God through the Apostle Paul, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of of the flesh. The New Living Translation says, let the Holy Spirit direct you or guide your life. In order to walk in your freedom, you will need to learn to walk by the Spirit, in other words. Now, what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? This goes beyond a gift of the Holy Spirit, which we need and which we cherish. We need the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. If we're going to be the church that God wants us to be, if we're going to be effective in carrying out our mission, but it's more than that. It's more than just a one-time encounter with the Holy Spirit. Now, we cherish and even crave and go after encounters with the Holy Spirit. And we need encounters with the Holy Spirit. But what Paul is saying is, no, you need to go beyond a spiritual gift. You need to go beyond an encounter with the Holy Spirit. You're going to need to learn to walk with the Holy Spirit. Spirit or walk by the Holy Spirit. How do you do that? How do you walk in freedom? That's part, really, really what he's saying. Well, I remember as a, as a father, this, this could be a dad thing. Mothers could do it as well, but I think it's actually more of a, a father thing perhaps. But I remember my dad when I was a little boy, you know, I might have been five years old. He would have, he would invite me over to stand on his feet which when I'm five years old, he's, he's, he's gigantic, you know, <laughs> my dad, you know, he's, he's three times as, as big and strong as I am, you know, he's, he towers over me, he's the authority in my life. And I remember I would hug him and put my arms around him, or, or, or I think I would hang on his, his arms perhaps, and I would stand on his feet and he would walk, and as he would walk, I would walk with him. <laughs> And it was, it was just, I don't know why, it's just a fond memory of my, my dad walking. And I would stay, you could say, I would stay, I, I would be walking in step. We're going to look at that scripture in a minute. I kept in step with him. And so if he sped up, I sped up. If he slowed down, I slowed down. And as long as I kept in step with him, as long as I kept in rhythm with him and went where he was going, it was smooth and there was freedom there. You could say there was freedom in there. Now, if I wanted to go this way and he went that way, suddenly the freedom was gone. There was conflict and there was, there was tension. Paul says, walk by the Spirit. Galatians 5, 24 and 25 says, those who belong to Christ Jesus, that's our choice, whether we belong to Christ Jesus or not. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And he says, since we live by the Spirit, here it is, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let's tune in to what God wants us to do through his word. God, the Holy Spirit so often uses God's word if you read it. If you listen, ask. When you read the Bible, please, 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 don't just read it for knowledge. I read it for knowledge, certainly study it, get to know it, of course. But ask Holy Spirit as I'm reading, what do you want to say to me through your word? And if you do, he will. And that's one of the ways you keep in step with the Holy Spirit. You just lean in, press in and listen and see what he says. See, sometimes things will jump off the page. Sometimes it's not as obvious to me, but the Holy Spirit will lead you. And it's a way of walking in the Spirit, keeping in step with with the Spirit day by day. Take Him to work with you. Uh, read the Word before work. Read the Word after work. Take those daily office times that we've been talking about in the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality course. 
Um, in fact, these days I wonder if we aren't more in step with the news than we are with the Holy Spirit. That's a temptation because there's so much happening in our world. Well, Paul says if you want to be free, it's going to take more than tuning into the news. Galatians 5.1, it says this, For freedom the Christ has set us free. I've, been given, I've given you the freedom from bondage of doing and trying to earn your salvation. That's what he's basically saying. And this is why, why Paul makes a whole bunch of pointed statements in this letter to the Galatians. He makes these, here's just a few of the examples. In Galatians 1.6, uh, it says, he says, I am shocked. In verse 7, he says, I'm astounded that you now embrace a distorted gospel, which is really no gospel at all. And then Galatians 4, 19 and 20, he says, My dear children, for whom I am in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could go, I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. You can hear these, these pointed letters. And then Galatians 3, 1, he says, You foolish. Galatians. I mean, he holds nothing back. There's a passion there behind these words. It's like, you foolish, Andy, you foolish. Wow, that's just hard words, you know. You foolish Galatians. And then he says, who has bewitched you? All right. And then verse 3 says, are you so foolish? After beginning by the means of the Spirit. He says, are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? All right? In other words, where the Spirit is, there's freedom. Where the flesh is, there's bondage. And then uh, verse 12 of Galatians 5, he says, As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. The Amplified Version actually translates that word emasculate to I wish they would go the, the whole way and castrate themselves. And I'm thinking, uh, okay, Paul, uh, a little harsh there. Castrate yourselves? I mean, come on. What he's saying is after all that Christ has done for you, you still act as if you have to earn it. As if, as if you could ever be des deserving of the precious gift of salvation. As if there's any amount of money you could give or any amount of time you could volunteer or any amount of good deeds that would somehow surpass what Jesus did on the cross for you. And Paul said, when you give up what Jesus did on the cross for you and start leaning on what you can do, you're in bondage. And God wants you to live in freedom. And so Paul is clearly passionate about this. Well, look at Look with me in the rest of the chapter, Galatians 5, 16. All right, this is so, so rich. This, I hope this is one of those chapters you return to over and over again. But Jason, Galatians 5, 16 says, so I say, Paul's like, oh, it's almost like Paul said, okay, folks, guys, guys let, me, let me just show you what freedom is. Let me explain it to you. Okay, here he says, so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires... What is contrary to the spirit and the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other. You, you sometimes feel that conflict. And so you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under law. In other words, if you're led by the spirit, you're not in bondage. There's freedom from bondage. And here's what bondage looks like. All right, here's what he says. Just This is pretty obvious. Verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. I'm using the word bondage because Paul's talking about freedom. Well, this is the opposite of freedom. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality. I can tell you there's bondage. Tremendous bondage in sexual immorality. The enemy will make it look right and he'll make it look appealing and he'll make it look like the most pleasurable thing in the world. I'm telling you, he'll turn it on you, and he'll turn it into bondage every time. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And he says, I warn you, it's almost like a parent, you know, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those, again, hard words from the Apostle Paul. This is what bondage looks like. Well, okay, that's bondage. Here's what freedom looks like. All right, here's the good stuff. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, just, just, just breathe this in. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in, here it is again, let us keep in step with the Spirit. It's, it's a given. If you're gonna, if you're gonna follow Jesus, you're gonna need to live by the Spirit. It, it goes with the territory, if you will. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. 2 Corinthians 3, 9, 3, 17 says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You know what? When I think of the fruit of the Spirit, fruit comes from life, doesn't it? You can't go to the store and, and, and buy, like, manuf you can't go to a factory and manufacture fruit. You can't really buy by the fruit of the Spirit. You can't go to the workshop and build it. It comes from life. It comes from connection, doesn't it? It comes from, in this case, relationship. Where there's no relationship, where there's no connection, guess what? There's no fruit. And where there's no fruit, there's no life. There's no freedom. That's what Paul is saying. Where there's no connection, there's no freedom. There's no fruit of the Spirit. That's where the freedom comes. This is not a the fruit of the Spirit list. <clears throat> Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You know, this is not a doing list. Think about that for a minute. This isn't like a try harder sermon. Okay, now, you guys, okay, this week now, come on, come on. Have more joy. Have more love. Love people. Do better with it. No, that, you could certainly try those things, and we probably should try those things. But that's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, this is not a doing list. It, it is a being list, if you will. Fruit of the Spirit is not a list of do's. It's not a tr about trying harder. It's about becoming who you are. It's about living out of your connection with Jesus and understand who we are and just being who you are. Before launching his public ministry uh, of doing, if you will, Jesus spent almost 30 years in hiddenness. Now think about that. You know, we we want to we want to watch the news about these, you know, the, about the sixteen-year-old millionaire, you know, who made it big because they were so smart and they worked so hard. And those are amazing stories. Well, Jesus spent almost thirty years, the Son of God, in hiddenness and being deeply establishing his identity and oneness connection if you will oneness with the father and once he launched his ministry jesus intentionally moved back and forth between doing active ministry and being alone with the father scazero peace scazero goes on to say when jesus selected the 12 to be his inner circle he followed the same pattern re requiring that they be with him before doing ministry for him he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons, Mark 3, 14 and 15. Well, after Jesus' death and resurrection, guess what? The, the 12 uh, then carried on in his this pattern of being before doing as they led the early church, giving their attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Uh, that took precedence over all else. You can read about it in Acts chapter 6. Even when the church experienced explosive growth, they refused to allow the incessant demands and problems of ministry to compromise their grounding in being with Jesus. All right, you've got Jesus as, as an example. You've got the early church as an example. And then number three, in the first 300 years of the church, the early church realized, right, sorry, you got Jesus as the example, the 12, and then the early church. All right, the early church realized that simply getting people to do Christian behaviors, all right, this is getting back to what Paul is saying in Galatians, right? You think that you can earn your way? No, 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 no. In, in the early church, they thought, you know, they realized that they can't simply get people do, to do Christian behaviors, attending worship, evangelizing, and participating in fellowship. That wouldn't be enough um, for people to stand firm in Jesus amid such pressure and persecution that broke out. And so they established a very clear pathway to help people grow in the being with Jesus so that they could persevere in their witness and life for Jesus. That's, that's just pure gold. That's just pure gold. The example of Jesus, the example of the 12, the example of the early church. Well, with the emotionally healthy discipleship approach that we've been taking for the last couple of years, we've been slowing down the discipleship process 
and radically shifting our priorities. I don't know if you've noticed that, but we have been. And the conversations and the questions we ask are different. We need to become more reflective. And now we regularly ask the questions, first of all, do I really want people to imitate the way I'm living? That's a better question than do I really want the Im people to imitate what I'm doing? No, we're asking the question, do I want people to imitate the way I'm living? Another question we ask is, in what areas of my life am I speaking of things I'm not living? Skizero gives three statements that summarize this before you do approach to ministry. Here's the statements. This is powerful. Number one, you cannot give what you do not possess. And that's so related to what Paul is saying. Paul is saying in Galatians, no amount of hard work is going to get the job done. This is, this is, uh, working is good. There are things certainly that need to be done. There's work that needs to be done, but you've got to be before you do. You've got to live in freedom. And that freedom comes from that connection with, with Jesus. Number two, Skazero says, what you do is important, but who you are is even more important. And number three, this is the challenging one. The state you are in is the state you give to others. Now, I don't know about you, but as, as a parent, I find that challenging. It's not just what I do that my kids see. It's who I am that will actually have the bigger impact. The fruit of the Spirit is so much about who you are, so much more about who you are than what you do. And Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is, the re is, is not necessarily, in a sense, it's, it's not really the goal. It's the result of the goal. The real goal is to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Is to walk by the Holy Spirit. Walk in freedom. Well, Mark 3.14, it says, Jesus, he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. He first called them to be with him, first priority to be with them. It's like the first two commands, isn't it? The, the greatest commands, love God first. Jesus said, okay, first be with me. And then second, we'll go out and do. Love God first and then love people second. Unfortunately, that's, um, here's what following Jesus looks like for many Christians. There's a, a scale that Peace Gazira puts in the doing way out, uh, out uh, ways the being and that's many Christians that's the case and for me that was the case for a lot of years my doing way out outweighed my being and if that's the case you're like the older brother in the story of the prodigal son you have maybe faithfully been doing good things all these years you're not the rebel who left home and shamed your father and yet you're living outside of the father's presence where there's freedom and this is why in the prodigal son story, the prodigal son father actually literally pleaded. That's the word that is used in the NIV. He pleaded with the older son to come into the party, to come in where his, his presence was, where the joy was, where the celebration was. And the older son thought he had earned. The problem was the older son thought he had earned his father's favor because of all his years of doing, because of all his years of faithfulness. Because Zero says this, when our discipleship model looks like this, the, the, the scale with the doing outweighing the being, we end up with shallow disciples. That's troubling to me. It reminds me of the famous American couple, Ken and Barbie. Ken and Barbie, they've got beautiful complexion. They've got perfect hair. I mean, they've got wonderful clothes. They've got all kinds of accessories. Their bodies are perfectly apportioned. I mean, they are just a, a all-American, wonderful, perfect couple, except, you know what? They're plastic and they're artificial and they're shallow. And Skazero says, when we have a, a discipleship, when we think of following Jesus as just doing, 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 and we're not living in the freedom of being connected with Christ, walking in freedom, walking in the spirit, we end up with shallow discipleship and nobody's attracted to shallowness. Well, Skazero says the Christian journey is a life of ever deepening trust, much like the ongoing stages of friendship. When we equate doing for God, religious activity as being with God, 
we remain only acquaintances of him, not intimate friends. Galatians 5 verse 4 says, You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Now guess what? When you separate yourself from Christ, you separate yourself from the source of freedom and the fruit of the Spirit that Jesus has given us free access to by his blood. Acts 4 13. I love this account of the early church. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled and ordinary men, they were astonished. That they, and they took note that these men, it doesn't say they took note that these men worked hard. I hope they worked hard, but that's not what they said. And it doesn't say these men, they took note of how educated these men were. Well, I hope they were educated. Some of them were, some of them were. Actually, it says they weren't educated. It doesn't say how gifted they were even. Or how experienced they were. No, it says they took note that they had, listen, they had been with Jesus. That's, that challenges me. That speaks to me. Let your doing come from your being. Value your freedom. Walk in your freedom. Number three, use your freedom to serve others. All right, Christ, it's for freedom that Christ has set you free because he he's just loves you that much. He wants you to be free. But he wants you to be free so you can be free, but also so that you can use your freedom to serve other people. That's what Galatians 5.13 says. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. This isn't like a license to sin of, hey, I can do whatever I want. No, no, no. Use your freedom in the spirit rather to serve one another humbly in love. That's what it says. Now ask yourself, is there not a huge huge door of opportunity that is open right now for the church. I'm going to turn off the AC for a second. It's a little loud. All right, I hope you stayed with me. Is there not a Is there not a huge open door of opportunity open right now for the church? I think so. I I think absolutely. In fact, the uglier and more distasteful, if I could use those words, that everything becomes, and the people who have the flavor and the freedom of Jesus about them will have an amazing opportunity. The people that exude love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, those are the people that will be able to make a difference that will be able to serve others because they themselves will be free. If you have that kind of fruit in your life, guess what? You're free. And if you're free, you're free to serve others. Because if you're not free, you know what? You're serving others becomes self-serving. I've done my share of that. I, I, at times I've served others really out of my own need, frankly, my own need to be needed. And I'll confess there have been times in my own ministry, there have been times that I've done what I've done and I've worked hard and tried to excel because I was feeding my need to be needed. Just confession there. But when you're free, you know what? You don't need to be needed. You already know you're free. You already know who you are. That freedom is already there. Your cup is already full and you can go out and be free to serve other people. What, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message? And equally important, will you obey? Father, I pray for any here in the sound of my voice that are watching and they're thinking, I, man, I'm not living in freedom, but I want to live in freedom. I pray that you would reveal the path to freedom. Lord, show them the, the fact that they have access to the very presence of the Lord through prayer, through the word of the Lord. Father, I pray for those who are beginning to be hungry for the freedom that they, maybe they've not had, or maybe they used to have freedom and they gave it up because they they turn to these, their sinful nature. Lord, I pray that they would have courage and they would have a, a, a boldness and a desire and a hunger in their hearts to follow you because you said if we're, if we're hungry, we'll be filled. I pray this in Jesus' powerful name, the name above all names. And everybody said, God bless you. Would you raise your hands for the benediction? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever, ever ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And everybody said, now go and 
be the church. 